I've uh, had the uh, privilege of sort of following Joe's career at Skidmore since uh, he joined the firm in 1974. Uh, at that time, I think he, he rose through the ranks and developed a very strong, singular voice within the then probably three to 400 uh, person firm in the, uh, in the 80s. And uh, I think the, his work at that time included a number of small buildings, small office buildings, civic buildings, and he was working on Rose Wharf in, in Boston, which is probably one of the best uh, well-known buildings at that time during the 80s. I think we've seen Joe rise uh, through, the, through the ranks at Skidmore to form his own studio. Uh, one of the things I think that impressed me about Joe was that he was always actively involved in, in all his projects, and I guess I sensed that actually the, the buildings that he worked on and, and he designed uh, were actually uh, very intimate to, to his uh, work. He probably, he probably even knew where the, uh, the toilets were in the buildings. And uh, as, as an architect, I think it's incredibly important to uh, have that sort of hands-on approach in, in working with the buildings. Uh, Joe is a graduate of Oklahoma State in uh, 1973. He's a Loeb Fellow at, uh, at Harvard in 1989. Uh, in addition to uh, numerous works and awards from around the world, uh, he has a number of buildings in Chicago that you probably have seen but didn't uh, connect with, with his name. These include 303 West Madison, which won a 1985 PA award, One North Franklin, and the uh, New Spiegel headquarters. Would you uh, please welcome Joe Gonzalez. Um, thanks to, uh, to Ken Schroeder, um, who, as he pointed out, I've known some time now uh, in relationship to the, uh, to the school. In fact, it was Ken who first asked me to, to come over to the, um, uh, to the School of Architecture many years ago and crit on uh, some, uh, some uh, classes that he was, uh, he was uh, giving in a... Uh, Inevitably, I couldn't find my way to the studio that uh, I was invited to, uh, uh, to, but I eventually got there and I thought made, uh, uh, made some interesting comments about what was or was not going on. I, um, I, I thought I was going to get here late. I just, uh, I just made it here a little bit after five, and I just wanted, uh, I apologize to Ken for getting here late, but uh, I have... Um, uh, committed by myself in addition to working on, on, on projects and lecturing and things like that. I'm also on the uh, Landmarks Commission in the city of Chicago and a uh, somewhat dubious, uh, dubious uh, position since I am, I am neither really a preservationist uh, per se nor um, do I think that uh, uh, random development of buildings is appropriate. So I please neither the preservationists nor the developers. So everybody's upset with me uh, when I leave these meetings. And I spent four hours this afternoon there uh, uh, dealing with a matter on, uh, uh, on Astor Street, Astor and Schiller, and a uh, rather volatile uh, 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 community group there, as you might expect, but very, um, very um, uh, strong-willed, uh, aligned with attorneys representing both sides, and so the uh, commission sits back and listens. And uh, we had an interesting, the last meeting with, with regards to this project, um, uh, one of the attorneys accused the other attorney of having doctored a photograph to the extent that they were showing garbage in front of this house uh, inappropriately because uh, they wanted to portray a uh, uh, a rather abysmal situation in front of the house. So they had put garbage in front of the house, taken a picture of the, the context uh, of this particular house addition, and then the lawyers went at it for about 15 minutes about whether the garbage was really there or not, or it was wind blown, and um, it's, uh, it's amazing. But uh, I think, uh, for me, cities are, are paramount. I, I grew up in a city. Um, I, I believe passionately in them. And so this, this uh, sort of sideline of mine is, uh, uh, has to do with that sort of uh, insanity about uh, uh, the, the care for cities. 
it, it, it leads me to, to wonder what actually happened in the 80s uh, throughout, throughout cities uh, in this country. Uh, I, I can't imagine, particularly in Chicago, how it all got away from us. The, um, the current stock of office space, which of the overstock, is, is symbolized by that, uh, by that slide that you see there on, the, uh, on your right, which was done by a, a friend of mine, uh, Ken Sheets, who's also a client on the One North Franklin building. And it represents a thousand story building and it symbolizes the uh, overcapacity of office space that we currently have in the city. And it's really astonishing when you think back at that period in the 80s that, that such, such uh, uh, an event could, uh, could happen. And you have to wonder what it all means. The, um, um, in, in San Gimignano, between the, the 12th and 14th uh, century, they built 75 towers, and the nobility was very good at impressing one another with their wealth by building uh, these vertical elements throughout, throughout uh, the city to show uh, the competing power among the, among the nobility. Uh, I, as, I assume that there are only 12 of those 75, I believe, are, are left. And um, it's, um, uh, I'm not sure if, if the same um, uh, intent was happening in the 80s. I suspect that the motivation was a little different. But the, the resultant uh, uh, overstock of building, I think, is, uh, is, uh, is, rather, is rather dreadful. And I, and I have a thought, I think, about how to perhaps uh, uh, remedy that. The, in, in the medical field, uh, they have established a process called CON, which is a certificate of need. Certificate of need was enacted in 74 and implemented in 75, and it's a very basic premise. Um, it, the intent in, in the CON was to limit duplication of services and waste between competing hospitals by regulating the approval of startups and addition of beds and diagnostic and treatment services. So if you needed to build more beds or diagnostic facilities, the process requires you to submit a strategic planning and cost justification, uh, which includes defining your potential market share and cost paybacks. And I, I think that's a wonderful idea. If you, if you want to build something and make an addition to a city, you somehow should be able to justify why you're building it and who you're building it for. And, and uh, it's a sort of a basic uh, supply and demand uh, notion that I think is an excellent strategy for are, are, uh, are wh whenever they start another cycle of, of office buildings, that we develop some kind of council, a real estate council or office building council, which looks after how these buildings are built, where they're built, and is there a need? Um, so uh, this endears me greatly to our developer uh, clients. But anyway, that's, that's, that's one way to solve that, uh, that problem. The, um, the other, one of the other matters that I, that I wanted to talk about here this evening was the uh, current state of architecture, which very simplistically I, I characterize as the wiggle. <clears throat> now, where, where does the wiggle come from? Um, the wiggle comes from a book that I, uh, that I, that I really love that's called uh, uh, by a guy named uh, Philip Isaacson, who's not an architect. Uh, and it's called Round Buildings, Square Buildings, and Buildings That Wiggle Like a Fish. Um, Mr. Isaacson is, as I said, not an architect, but he is a, um, actually, I think he's an attorney and an um, architectural fanatic and an incorrigible photographer. But the book is, is quite, um, uh, quite a marvelous book and one that um, uh, I have, um, since 1988, when I, when I first purchased it, have followed it closely in, in, in some of the fundamentals that it deals with with regards to architecture and the making of, of buildings. Um, the, the, the reason the, the, the title is what it is, I was out with Blair Kamen looking at the Spiegel project in August and, uh, and Blair and I were walking around the building and uh, we got to the, and I'll show you the building later, we got to the west side of the building which has the curved uh, serpentine uh, uh, facade, and Blair looked at it and he said, you know, the, the building wiggles. And I said, uh, no, it doesn't. And he said, yeah, I think the building, the building really wiggles. 
So um, I, I, was, I was very frustrated by his observations. I, um, I've been out there many times. I uh, have spent a lot of time with the building, looked at it, and it's never wiggled for me. And I was a bit frustrated by, uh, by Blair's observation. Then, then I got a call about giving a, a couple of lectures, and, and um, uh, it wasn't enough that I was going to talk about current work or projects underway. It was important to have a title, I was told. So I scratched my head, and I you know, was down to, the, down to the deadline in terms of giving, giving a title. So uh, the book was on my desk, and I said, well, maybe it ought to be buildings that don't wiggle like a fish. And therein lies the, uh, the, title, the title of this lecture. And um, uh, part, of it, part of it has to do with, uh, again, observations about uh, this nervous energy that, that has resulted, um, I think, in our field somewhere in the mid-80s, mid to late 80s, 86, 88, when the real estate uh, boom was, was, uh, was slowing down. Uh, uh, we, were, we were getting tired of the historicism and that, that whole direction that architecture was, uh, uh, was, was pursuing in, in a number of areas. Uh, schools were changing, and um, the, the young architects, I think, developed a nervousness, probably to, uh, through the fact that they were anticipating uh, this uh, uh, tremendous lack of work that, that occurs uh, today in, in, in the field, and also because uh, there, were, there were influences on, on the thought process uh, after post-historicism that had to do with a certain way of speaking and language. It is, uh, it is hard for me in the office, in our office, um, which um, I, I thought it was kind of Ken to say that the office in the, our office in the 80s was between three and 400 because depending on your position, you say it's either eight, it was 800 to 1200 and now it's only 250. So I was, thank you for the for the modesty uh, there in, in our drop in, in size. Uh, but um, I, uh, uh, w when I talk to, to the, younger, uh, the younger folks in our studios, uh, it's really hard not to get into a uh, discussion about fragmenting or slicing, uh, dissecting, relocating, and, and, it, and it sort of goes on and on. And, it's, and, it's, and, I, and I just wonder, wonder about that whole strategy. Uh, we were actually looking at the backstage area for the uh, Lyric Opera project that, that I'm working on. And, uh, and, and I had a 20-minute discussion about, the, or I heard a 20-minute um, uh, interpretation about how the backstage ought to be sliced and, and dissected and relocated, et cetera. And I was, I was just amazed at the whole, at the whole manner of, in which this, this, uh, this area of the project was, was being treated. Uh, so, so I, I, with the help of, uh, of um, David Greenspan and others, I, I, I was curious in how to, or where to trace this, uh, where to trace this manner of speaking. Of course, most of you here know, since you, since you have been uh, with the the source of some of this for some time, and um, I, what I want to do now is is quote from uh, from an, uh, um, a. a uh, an article called the Blue Line Text. <clears throat> and, and I want to quote from this and then contrast it with the manner or the way in which Isaacson speaks about, uh, about architecture. Um, from the Blue Line Text, and I quote, what is the between in architecture? If architecture traditionally locates, then to be between means to be between some place and no place. If architecture traditionally has been about topos, that is an idea of place, then to be between is to search for an atopos, the atopia within topos. Many American modern cities are examples of atopia, yet today architects want to deny the atopia of today's existence and restore the topos of the 18th century, to bring back a condition that can no longer be. Equally, the lesson of modernism suggests that there is no topos of the future, the new topos of today has to be found by exploring our inescapable atopia of the now, somewhere be between topos and atopia. Okay. He's in, he's in my book, the, the, the captain of the Wiggle team in, in the way of, in the way of, way of writing. Um, from Isaacson book, Isaacson's book, um, and again, excuse me for resorting, uh, resorting to basics, but 
his writing is quite wonderful, and I'm, I'm going to quote from, from the first chapter. Uh, he's describing a building. This is a building in a small city in northern India. People come from all over the world to see it. Many of them come because they feel that it is the most beautiful building in the world. It is called the Taj Mahal, and it is a valentine from a great emperor to a wife who died when she was very young. It is made of marble, the color of cream. Each afternoon, the sun changes the color of the Taj Mahal. First, it turns it, turns it pink, then yellow, then the color of apricots. In the evening, it becomes brown, and when the moon shines on it, it is blue and gray. In the moonlight, it becomes the old emperor asleep and dreaming. One more quote from, from uh, Isaacson's book. These wonderful buildings tell us many things about beauty. First, they tell us that there are many kinds of beauty. There is beauty in buildings that look soft and creamy, in buildings that look short and strong, and in buildings that are sharp and tall. They also tell us that all beautiful buildings, indeed all beautiful things, have a magical feeling about them. That feeling is called harmony. A building has harmony when everything about it, its shape, its walls, its windows and doors, seems just right. Each must be a perfect companion for the other. When each suits the other so well that they come to belong to one another, that building is a work of art. Okay, now, now I will go back to the blue line text. And very quickly, uh, the idea that architecture must be in the tradition of truth, must represent its sheltering function, must represent the good and the beautiful, constitutes a primitive and unnoticed repression. In fact, it is this, this truth of instability which has been repressed. Now, and I, th when I got to the line uh, that, it, that it must represent the good and the beautiful, uh, constitutes a primitive and unnoticed repression, I sort of stopped. And I stopped for a couple of reasons, primarily because I was uh, raised a Catholic, and I was uh, raised a Catholic in a, a Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn. So the idea of uh, guilt and repression and all that kind of stuff just seems very, very natural to me. And so I, I was, you know, I was somewhat offended by the, uh, by the, uh, by denying me that, so that was the end for me in terms of the, um, the, the reading of that uh, particular gentleman's work. But, um, okay, I've lost my place. The, um, there, there can be nothing uh, more current in, in the writing about architecture, of course, than the, uh, than the New York Times, and uh, in, uh, on September 26, there was, an, there was an article in the New York Times, uh, and the, the lead to the article, which was about architecture, was in the front of the Arts and Leisure section, and I read through it because I always look for the architecture section first, and it said something about a building being shot, or a new shot in the Manhattan skyline. I thought, my God, there's been a crime. You know, someone has shot a building, or we've, there's been a, an assassin hired to shoot buildings, or a, a thought that I've actually had uh, in the past, so I thought maybe it was, it was finally had happened. Then I turned to, the, um, to, the, to page 45, where the, the article itself uh, was, and the article uh, described a nervous prism of a building for Manhattan. <clears throat> now, uh, the, the words shot and nervous, of course, got me nervous, but, but I, read, I read through the article, and um, I, I, I presume that the project is being heralded by, by, the, uh, by the critic for, for a number of reasons. One is that the facade is of sharp-edged glass sliding down like a blade. The other one is that, that for once a curtain wall is as much curtain as it is wall, projecting and uncontained. And when I, when I read the words and looked at the picture uh, and thought of the building on 52nd Street, you know, I, I got this impression of, of myself walking, walking down 52nd Street and seeing this thing and sort of crossing the street to the other side for fear that this thing might slide down on me at some unbeknownst time and, and, and you know, come colliding down on, on, on my head and, and my family and all that. Um, and 
and, and, of, and of course, because it's a shot and it's nervous, uh, I guess that makes it a nervous shot. And it was, it was uh, again, in reading this, I, I, um, I didn't know that architecture was about shots. I thought that a shot was something, you know, that the doctor gives you. I thought, um, I can't say anything about Michael Jordan, but I thought it was a shot that, uh, a shot is something that the coach of the Bulls tells John Paxson to go out and do, go out and take a three-point shot, or there's a slingshot. In, in any case, what, what, was, what, what, what disturbed me was that the shot, whether it's an injection or, or whatever, is a temporal kind of matter. It's, you know, it's sort of in your system and then it's, then it's gone. And uh, so there was a, in addition to the use of the words, the, the thought of this being simply a shot and a nervous one at that, uh, really, um, really had me uh, uh, confused. But uh, again, I, I thought it was very indicative of of, of the of the writing and perhaps the thinking of uh, of what we of of what we're hearing today. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but um, uh, some of you are probably too young. But I miss I miss Ada Louise Huxtable. Um, no one in my mind captured the the essence of of architecture. And, and the writing and got down to the, um, the substance of it than, than she did. She, uh, she had uh, wrote an introduction uh, into a book about, uh, to a, about a uh, book uh, which was about Jim Sterling and uh, one, of, one of my favorite architects. And I, I just want to read what it is she said in relationship to Mr. Sterling and the creative process. The creative processes in architecture have less to do with the muses of inspiration, philosophy, or writings than with the painstaking resolution of site, program, structure, and plan. She goes on to talk about the, 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 the very personal decisions that give the solution a sort of shape and style. But ultimately, one comes back to the resolution of some fundamental aspects in architecture which have to do with the site, the program, the structure, and the plan. And I, I, again, again, I find that uh, very refreshing. And I miss, miss her approach to, uh, uh, to, to writing. Um, for, for buildings that, uh, that don't wiggle, that don't slice, dice, or dissect themselves, then, then what have we to do? The, the answer, I think, uh, at least the beginning, is, is that we take uh, uh, Ada Louise Huxtable at her word. Let's adopt these fundamentals uh, in architecture that have to do with the client and program, that have to do with plan, with form, structure, and light. And I, I think it would be wise also, mixing Isaacson and others in there, that, that we add the idea of beauty. Um, <clears throat> Another one of my, my favorite architects, uh, Luis Barragan, uh, once wrote uh, about beauty. And he referred to beauty as the invincible, he, he wrote beauty, the invincible difficulty that the philosophers have in defining the meaning of this word is unequivocal proof of its ineffable mystery. Beauty speaks like an oracle, and ever since, man has heeded its message in an infinite number of ways. I, I think that if we take the, the five or six basics that, that, uh, that, that Ada Louise wrote about in reference to, uh, to Mr. Sterling and in architecture in general and sort of mix in a little, a little beauty and, uh, and a little mystery, I think we have, we have the, 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 the appropriate beginnings for, uh, for uh, the kind of work at least that I, would, uh, that I am interested in pursuing. So in that light, I thought I would use those, those basic fundamentals as a springboard for some of the work that, I, uh, that I'd like to show you. What I'm going to do is, is show you two, um, two recently uh, completed projects and then show you uh, three projects that are currently, uh, currently in design. Can I? Uh, it's Robert, right? The, the first project that I wanted, that I wanted to, uh, let's see, I have one of these things. This, this really makes you look like you wiggle and are nervous, so I, maybe. Um, the, um, 
For the first project I wanted to talk about was the uh, New Spiegel uh, uh, corporate headquarters. Um, and uh, having been described by Mr. Kamen as a foot person, uh, which I assume mean, means I have two feet and I use them, uh, uh, the, this building and this project occurred uh, in, in the suburbs, that place where we have traffic and cars and expressways and all that good stuff. I also, I also think that the suburbs are an opportunity. One of the opportunities have to do with the establishment of a place in doing a building and also uh, the opportunity to interact, at least in this case, with clients. In Spiegel, we had a, an, an, a new, an, one of the challenges that Spiegel uh, <clears throat> posed to us was how are you going to get to know us? Uh, we're going to tell you things. Some of them may be true. Some of them may not be true. How are you going to get to know us? And we, we found through talking to their uh, uh, ad people who were developing a new ad campaign and who had spent quite a bit of time with Spiegel that they had an incredible knowledge about what these guys uh, were about. Not, not what they were saying to us, but the, what they were saying to them and what they were trying to convey about themselves. Spiegel had just embarked, about, embarked upon this new ad campaign, which was really quite striking graphically and began to portray Spiegel in, uh, in their minds a, a different light. So what we did is that we took, uh, we had been given uh, uh, reports about their structure and what they were aiming, aiming to be in the future. And we took their words and we developed our own ads. And we used the ads as a means to communicate with them about their project, about architecture, and about what their aspirations, what their goals would be in the context of this, um, in the context of this project. So we used words of uh, unique creative force and, and, and used other words, again, from, from their material uh, to us and assigned images to them to get responses uh, from them, uh, uh, both visually and in terms of uh, ideas for the, 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 the feeling of the project, the sense of, of who they were and what their personality was really about. We, uh, after the campaign, we, we quickly developed a, a series of alternatives. The slide on the left is is the uh, initial four alternatives, which I call uh, <clears throat> Spiegel City. And the one on the right, we, we quickly uh, were down to, to two schemes. And, and finally, uh, you see this, uh, this rather unique site for this uh, office building of approximately 600,000 square feet. The unique thing about this site is that it's, it, it, it has uh, an incredible two-sided quality to it. On the left, of uh, the slide on the right is the is a forest preserve, uh, which uh, has some wonderful views, a uh, very densely wooded uh, site. And on the right, or to the east of, of our site, <clears throat> two tollways come come by in a north in a north south uh, uh, north south manner, and those tollways lead uh, lead back to uh, uh, to Chicago, the the city of Chicago. The the great opportunity in, in exploring uh, this, uh, this, this aspect of the site is, is, is that we looked to establish a building that could be responsive to both sides. On the, on the expressway side, the side that you all see when you drive back and forth, we wanted very much to create a um, uh, almost a billboard-like quality, an orthogonally-based geometry uh, a, a structural expression that would respond to the scale and the movement of cars along the expressway. To the west, the, the, the idea of the forest preserve was uh, responded to in plan by the idea of a, uh, a serpentine, uh, a curved form, serpentine form on the west side of the building, which would respond and reflect to the idea of that, uh, uh, of that, of that mood or of that side of the building. Uh, the idea of then water as a common element with, with regards to the front and the back or the east and the west was, uh, was something that we wanted to do in tying the two sides of the building together. Uh, we quickly developed sketches and ideas <clears throat> for the sense of frame and structure, <clears throat> which you see here, the, the one on the left is the, is, is the, is the east facade of the building. Uh, and the one on the right, an early study of that, 
of that west wall uh, conveying the kind of serpentine and, and, and softer notion of what we wanted to, uh, uh, to, ac to accomplish. Exterior wall models, line drawings beginning to convey uh, conceptually what it was that we were, uh, what, what we were trying to do. Uh, the building here, as you see on the, the photograph and the drawing to the right, is, is, has a very strong uh, frame expression that uh, fronts to the east. It is, um, it is a muscular but somewhat dynamic structural frame. Picks up on the traditions of the Chicago School, um, Chicago School of Architecture, but is somewhat um, uh, informal in its use of the frame uh, with the stepping towards uh, at the top going from, from east to west and the expression of the bar in the center, which is where the core elements, stairs, etc., <clears throat> occur. Uh, you see on the left the, the, ex the expression of frame as it, as, it, as it confronts the expressway and the entry to the building. And also with, with a suburban context of this kind, you must deal with cars so that the, the parking structure which was uh, uh, housing approximately 1,500 cars, was used as part of the frame expression to the, to the southern part of the building, and it begins to form a space as you enter the building. <clears throat> as you move around the building and, and go to the, um, to the north, the building begins to reveal itself in its layers and its, and its ideas of, of, of structure, service zone, and then the, the uh, more uh, serpentine zone of the project going or facing, uh, facing the west. This is the, this is the side that, according to Blair Wiggles, and uh, according to me, is, actually sets a wonderful uh, and serene uh, environment for the employees of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the building on the west side of the building in relationship to the, uh, the cafeteria space, which sits in the, in the pond, and in relationship to the forest preserve to the, uh, uh, to the west. Uh, you begin to see here the, the expression of a frame as it meets the ground, even on the west side, and becomes a common theme uh, for the building, as does the water as it links the building from, uh, from west to east. The, the cafeteria space is meant to be uh, again, a, a repose from the from the uh, hour by hour uh, environment of the um, uh, of the office uh, typical office floor, uh, one that looks out over the preserve, adds a bit of color and light, and becomes really a meeting place and a communal space for the for the building uh, uh, all day long. The 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 notion of of east west front back structure and, and, and curve is carried through even to the idea of the lobbies. The lobby, the, the, uh, the lobby on the west side of the building, the side facing the forest preserve, is actually situated one level below the main lobby. And that is in part for security and in part to allow a transition from the office environment to this, uh, to this uh, wood, wood floored a lobby space. The landscape was something that I wanted to bring into the space itself and begin to suggest the transition between the office environment and through the use of materials and the sound of, of the wood floor and the relationship to the cafeteria and the forest preserve, uh, I think is something that was uh, uh, <clears throat> successful in the context of this project. The idea of establishing this place in the suburbs and the use of light in the orientation of the buildings was also paramount in my mind. Uh, on the left, the, the, the street that leads you from the parking structure into the lobby is light-filled, uh, particularly in the morning as it faces east. There is a system of storefronts uh, on the, on the left-hand side which uh, begin to suggest the, uh, the quarterly uh, views of Spiegel in terms of their catalog. So the storefronts are, are filled with the upcoming catalog uh, displays for the, for the coming year. And a slide of the, uh, uh, of the main lobby, which works off the uh, uh, service of the, the uh, front drive from the east side of the building, you can see on the right. 
the idea of detail and how we how 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 man engages buildings, the, the, the type of materials, the coloration and this palette was something also that we wanted to uh, make, make sure that carried through in the, in the quality of this, of this building as it, as, it, as it carried through in all aspects, including the communications tower, which you see, which is at the top of the building, and the uh, custom light fixtures, which, which we designed, uh, uh, which are all around the, uh, all around the site. Uh, <clears throat> again, the, the essence of Spiegel comes from this, this notion of the frame, particularly as it relates to the east, the, the relationship to the water, the entry drive, and, and fundamentally concludes with the idea that a building can have uh, two very distinct sides relating to two very distinct conditions um, uh, on a site. And the idea for me remains as the, as the plan uh, shows, uh, uh, a rather basic one, particularly for a uh, building type that's, uh, that's uh, programmatically speaking, uh, uh, as dumb as you can get. I mean, it's, there's, uh, there are elevators and stairs and cores in the middle and office space, uh, office space around. Um, there have, the, the, the project has been described by, uh, uh, by many in different ways. Uh, I, I, I think uh, back to um, uh, the, 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 uh, the time in the late 70s where, where Bjorn Borg, the Swedish tennis star, was, was sort of at his pinnacle in and, and playing tennis. And there were these great matches between he and, and uh, John McEnroe that went on for three and four hours. And then there were the announcers who were attempting to describe particularly Borg's approach to tennis. And they could, they could somehow dazzle you for three hours, telling you what it was that uh, Borg was doing with this grip or the strings or, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, after a couple hours for me, I just basically turned the sound down and watched, uh, watched the, uh, the tennis. Um, but one particular match, what, what struck me was that this guy had been talking for three and a half, almost four hours. Borg had won the match and he had scheduled this interview as he came off the court. Um, and Borg is coming towards him and he's describing the strategy and he, he says, uh, Born, excuse me, we'd like to talk to you a little bit about how you won the match and, uh, and your strategy and, and, and so on and so forth. He said, could you tell us a little bit about how, how you think you won the game? And Borg looked at him and he said, well, most of the time I hit the ball cross court and every now and then when I see an opening, I hit the ball down the line. Smiled at him, walked off. In, in, in many ways, the, 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 the Borgs, the, the Sterlings, uh, have something to do with uh, some of the basics of, of tennis and architecture. And, and, and the, rest is, the rest is refinement, the rest is resolution, the rest is something that we bring to, to these fundamentals that have to do with our, our experiences and our travel and culture and so forth. Uh, on to the next suburb. We are a very, uh, a very, uh, uh, honored to be working at Ravinia. We've been uh, working with them for two years now and have been developing a, a master plan for, uh, for their facility in Highland Park. Ravinia, as most of you know, is, is simply a wonderful uh, lawn experience. Uh, it's, um, if, you've, if you've been around the country to places like uh, Blossom and Tanglewood or the Hollywood Bowl, you know how, how unique this, this festival is in the context of, uh, of this city and of festivals uh, uh, like it. It, it. Of course, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to have the Chicago Symphony in, in, your, in your lawn when you're there uh, picnicking, uh, but it is a, a, a magical place. And in the, in the, person, of this, uh, in the person of Zarin Mehta, our, 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 our very wonderful client at, uh, at, at uh, Ravinia, we have, uh, we have been developing a master plan uh, which really discusses some fundamentals about entry sequence and uh, how we might improve the lawn experience from the lawn in its relationship to the pavilion, uh, the identification of buildable areas on, on the site, and how we might um, uh, improve the, the landscape buffers uh, between particular parts of the, of the park itself and the residential uh, neighbors uh, around. We have, uh, we have uh, begun to look at a, uh, an entry sequence which, 
begins to uh, reinforce the positioning of the, of the newly renovated Murray Theater, which I'll show you some slides of. Uh, and we are uh, discussing and proposing the new, new entry buildings which will frame the existing gate into, uh, into Ravinia, but which will also promote the idea of movement as you arrive at Ravinia and, and passage into the, the, uh, uh, what we call the north and south uh, lawn uh, at Ravinia. The ends of this building, which are uh, uh, in, in early design studies now, will also house uh, food facilities which will, which will form uh, an attraction to these, um, to these centerpieces in relationship to the Murray Theater. Uh, Murray Theater, uh, we completed uh, last year, and we did extensive work not only on the exterior, but with the seating, the acoustics, the lighting, uh, the, uh, the development of stage, and, and, new, uh, uh, and, a new, uh, and a new acoustical shell for the, uh, for the stage. Uh, uh, for the stage itself. You can see the, the exterior on the left, which is, is uh, important because I think it, it's, it, it is, in our opinion, the, uh, the kind of centerpiece or gem in terms of performance, enclosed performance spaces at, uh, uh, at Ravinia, and it has signaled um, uh, to many of the board members and patrons that, that Ravinia can use uh, a sprucing up and a, new, and a new outlook in terms of how it's going to be uh, perceived going into the year uh, 2000 by a whole generation of, of new goers to the, uh, uh, to the park. Um, the new stage, we discovered a, a wonderful stenciling pattern which you begin to see on the, on the ceiling of the, uh, of the existing um, um, of the slide on the, um, on the right. The, um, the entry foyer from the uh, uh, on the slide on the left, new seating. In, in Sioux City, Iowa, we are, um, we are working on a, um, an art center uh, in Sioux City on a very prominent site that uh, we're very excited about because the positioning of the site um, has a very profound effect on its uh, relationship to the downtown as you first approach uh, 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 Sioux City uh, from the expressway side. Uh, the, the, the art center is, is, is first of all a community space which will have as its center a, a circular uh, space uh, which becomes a, a symbol for the community for gathering. It will also have a lecture hall and will have uh, uh, a cafe and dining facility um, uh, classroom spaces, gallery spaces, and it's a sort of a wonderful mixture of, of, of functions that will serve to provide uh, this community with a, a much needed heart in terms of an art center um, and, and, uh, and lecture and uh, uh, exhibition hall uh, for, this, uh, for this community. We, we chose to, to stay with a brick in the uh, in this, in this, in this uh, building, which is known as a Siouxland brick. Uh, there's a wonderful courthouse that, uh, in uh, Sioux City which has this brick and other buildings do. And then we chose to mix the idea of the, of the, of the native material, the traditional material, with, with very um, uh, modern sculptural forms, also um, uh, advancing the design of the rotunda and circulation space, which has a spiral stair which actually weaves its way on the outside of the, of the rotunda and uh, both in, in material and form we're, we're very excited about the, uh, uh, the opportunity that we have here in Sioux City. The project is currently under design and uh, we will be making a, uh, uh, <clears throat> a major design presentation towards the end of the month which uh, I believe will begin to uh, synthesize for us the the ideas of, of, of the building, and uh, and again, it's been a it's been a wonderful experience from a standpoint of what it's what it's meant to the community and this client. Um, <laughs> in Ixtapa, uh, Mexico, which is sort of like Sioux City, the the beach anyway is very similar to Sioux City's. Um, the um, 
we have a we have a, a, a wonderful client, a wonderful opportunity here in uh, in Ixtapa. Um, we were. Um, it's really the story of a um, of a lonely building, which was built in 1975, and you see on the slide on the right. This building was built just before the uh, the earthquake, which had its epicenter, I think, a few feet <clears throat> from our uh, from our site. And we were discussing the project with uh, with uh, uh, our client in Mexico City, who who uh, gave me the brochure on the wonderful beachfront in Ixtapa, which had this big picture of this uh, uh, lady on the uh, uh, on the left, and some very small lettering about what what in fact would. Uh, in need of help. One would say, well, why don't you tear the building down and sort of start over? Uh, what's happened here is that they have sold, it's a condominium project, approximately 200 uh, condominium units on this site facing the, facing the beach, which you see uh, to the south uh, in that, uh, in that, uh, to the bottom in that site, site plan. And um, they've sold uh, some 38 units in this building already pre-sold them. So we cannot take the building down because it's, it's, we just can't. Legally and, and, and for, for other reasons, marketing, psychological, whatever. So when, when I went down to, um, to Ixtapa with the client for the first time, I thought it would be wise to bring uh, uh, a structural engineer since this starts as a, as a seismic problem with, with the existing structure. And I have been very fortunate on this project and the, uh, and the next one you'll see to, to be working with a very brilliant structural, structural engineer from our office named Bill Baker. And I went down with Bill and I had, um, the, the client had been thinking of clustering different towers to the upper part of the site and the lower part of the site. And it was my, my uh, initial uh, intention to pull the idea of the project into, into a stronger form in the, in the, in the, in the center of the, of the site, as you saw in the sketch. Now, complementing that, that notion, and perhaps, uh, I'm not sure which came first, the, the cart, cart before the horse, or the, the idea of the existing building and how we would um, maintain it and seismically, seismically upgrade it was paramount in the, in the, in the success of uh, our being able to uh, proceed with the project. On the right, you see that the the building has a structural uh, uh, grid and a eccentrically eccentrically positioned concrete core, which does nothing but want to basically pull the building apart in 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 the course of an earthquake. What we did is that we said, let's get rid of that eccentric concrete core, and let's do some eccentric steel cores, and we pulled them away from the building so that they could be expressed as, as vertical elements. Then Bill said, let's also support this building with new buildings, um, which we call the two cousins on the right and the left of the existing uh, uh, floor plan. And that basically buttresses and supports the existing building in, in all seismic conditions, I'm told. We also, the building was designed to be 15 stories uh, we said, how many units have you sold? They said about uh, halfway to the seventh or eighth floor. We said, good, let's just keep it there, uh, not build the rest of it, get rid of that concrete core, and uh, avoid any existing change in the, uh, in the diaphragm, as you see in the, in, the, in the drawing on the left. The site plan then began to, to evolve using this principle of, of wanting to, to embrace uh, um, the beach and also understand how we could work seismically with the existing building. Now there is a, um, okay, this will test this pointer thing. Uh, there is a, a, a row of palm trees that exist all along the beachfront. This, our, our parcel here is the last of what is called the high rise parcels, meaning 15 stories uh, maximum along the beach. So we developed a scheme in such a way where the palm trees are, are, are captured essentially by the site and wrapped into, into a, a wonderful courtyard space which is developed by the, by, the, uh, by the form of the building. You can see it here in the, can you see this thing? I can, does this thing work? You can see it here in the form of the palm trees and how it wraps into the courtyard. 
you see here the existing building, the, the new structural zones, which I call the Baker zones, and the, the new elevator, uh, expressed steel elevator uh, core elements, uh, which are then pulled out from the, uh, from the essential mass, mass of the building for seismic reasons and, um, and, and the general organization. You see the, the overall form of the building. The other thing that, we were, that I was very interested in doing was uh, also on the, on, the, uh, on the land side. There is a street here, which is the main street in Ixtapa, called the uh, 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 Paseo de Ixtapa. And it ends in this circle, uh, if you can see that circle. We wanted to, I really wanted to make the circle feel like it was part of our entry sequence and, uh, and approach to the, to the entry court into the building. So we kept that, that relationship uh, as, a, as a very strong a determinant in the, in the massing and organization uh, uh, of the building. The building will be uh, built in, uh, primarily in concrete with very simple stucco finishes with the exception of the um, uh, core elements which will be built in steel uh, out of a steel structure clad in uh, metal and glass. And also we are developing a uh, as part of the plan, a system of fiberglass hand railings and uh, uh, shading, sun shading screens, which you will see uh, a, bit, uh, a bit of uh, here in a minute. The ground plan is uh, to the left. I give up. Uh, the ground plan is here on the left, and, and these, uh, these uh, spokes that you sort of see coming into the courtyard are derived from the, um, from the structural zones, the Baker zones, and at the second floor, you can actually get off and walk along a uh, bridge, uh, bridge system which extends into the courtyards and drops you off in relationship to the pool. Uh, the floor plans and how they begin to uh, step back. A detail on the right of how the, the steel and the concrete um, uh, come together, both in terms of the, uh, the elevator core, the link, the link passage between the core and the uh, typical circulation system. This is a single loaded um, uh, system which has balconies on the beach side and essentially a corridor on the, uh, on the land side. You see here the bridges that come out into the courtyard and a detail of the, uh, the stair. Uh, I talked about the, the, the railings. We, we are exploring the, uh, the idea of using these fiberglass railings in the context of the, uh, of the balconies and sunscreens, and also using, using the idea of color in Mexico, uh, which is a, a s sort of a native, uh, a native and a wonderful cultural uh, uh, idea that they have in, in the use of, of, uh, of buildings and, and, and painted uh, walls in their architecture. Um, this gives you some more ideas of how the building uh, meets the ground at, at the, uh, on the slide on the right, and how the balconies are developed in relationship to those walls. And this gives you an overview of how, how the building's terraces from the, uh, from the, from the uh, low side or the uh, uh, beach side up, up and over into the, uh, uh, what is the ground side of the uh, uh, back of the, uh, back of the site. I, I'm particularly pleased at how we are able to take, um, there was this whole thing about, you know, structural, structurally derived building and structuralism. This is, this is the building that I think has a, a, a weaving of, 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 of structure and architecture in a, in a very uh, elegant sort of way that we're, we're very happy with the promise of, of how this is going to, uh, going to turn out. Um, <clears throat> in, a, in yet another part of the world, Seoul, Korea, we are uh, working on a project which I'm very excited about, which is sort of a city within a city. It's a unique uh, mixed uh, uh, use building type. Um, the site at the airport uh, begins to, which you can see on the uh, right here. Is this thing? Uh, it is right there. Very constrained site, which uh, uh, has the airplane aprons coming to us in the in the development of the site, uh, and this is a, uh, a facility which will encompass a, uh, a hangar, a major hang hangar facility, 
shops and storage space, aircraft maintenance areas, uh, a commons area uh, in the, uh, the building which will accommodate uh, cafeteria, uh, dining, executive dining, health club, a, uh, a medical uh, and nursery uh, facility, uh, and, and other uh, uh, common spaces for, uh, for the employees. Above it will be an administrative office component, uh, which you can see on the uh, diagram uh, on the right. And our idea here was to really, because in part of the site constraint and the, and the wonderful mixture of, of, of functions, is to find a way to get the idea of the hangar and the airplane to sort of permeate all of, all of the other functions in, in relationship uh, uh, to the building. The, the, the dominant uh, form-giving uh, aspect of this, uh, of this project, again, comes from, from working with Bill Baker, our structural engineer, and developing a unique um, uh, uh, structural system for housing these three 747s, which rests the, uh, uh, as you see the diagram on the right, rests uh, the whole of the structure on three three columns. And those, there's a column there, a column there, and a column there. The span, that span is about 180 meters, and this span is about 90 meters. So it's quite, uh, quite a, a, a wonderful structure. In addition to this, the structure of the, of, the, um, of the hangar itself, the structural system for what surrounds the, the hangar is also responsive to some of the functional requirements. It starts out with a very, uh, with a small bay of about 7.5 7 meters, which was appropriate to the shops and storage area. And as we come up out of the ground and transition into the commons and office space, we went to a 15-meter um, structural span, which, uh, which you'll see on the expression of the building. This begins to give you a sort of what I call the x-ray of the, uh, of the building itself, uh, understanding the, the, uh, the point loads that, are, that, that we have at these, at these three points in the, in the structure itself, the three columns, and then the way these kind of, uh, and this is, this is a bow truss that spans in the 45 degree uh, direction, and then we have these other secondary trusses which, which span uh, perpendicular to that. Uh, this this building, um, uh, I, I guess, like Spiegel, has has a, a, a very clear front and back. This 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 air, uh, airplane side or apron side has to accommodate the clear span and the ability to to get three airplanes in and out of there at a moment's uh, notice. Um, and and that you could see the the sectional development of that idea on the drawing on the left, the beginnings of the. Uh, exterior expression of the building, which we devised in such a way to begin to suggest that there is a shop component at the lower floors, and then sort of something that springs uh, from the commons area up into the office spaces, and also reflects the idea of the structural span changing from 7.5 meters to 15 meters, and the kind of glassiness that's appropriate to the office space. Uh, office space beyond. This is a section through the interior of the hangar with the support space of an office building uh, uh, above. It was, it was very critical, as I said before, in our, in our thinking that the roof, that this roof form, beyond being uh, structurally uh, unique and wonderful, do something more in terms of daylighting, not only of the hangar, but how it might uh, assist us in penetrating uh, into the office space and the office environment. So as you can see by the sections, the, the light, there will be a sense of light coming from the roof. The hangar is also uh, glazed, but open to the, uh, to the office floors and the commons floors, so that as you're moving around the building, that side of the building that, that, that faces the hangar is actually uh, glazed, but open to the the day-to-day uh, -day activities that, that, occur, uh, that occur in the... Um, uh, in the hangar itself, here you you see some more development of the of the uh, bow truss, that long bow truss on the right, and uh, some. Um, I think that that's either Schulte or Barenboim conducting on the uh, on that knuckle there. I'm not quite sure. And another detail on the right of the uh, of a cross section through the uh, uh, through the uh, through the bow to the bow truss. Um, in closing. 
Uh, I, I, I talked about the wiggle and the fundamentals, and, and, and much of this has to do with, uh, with, with where you are uh, personally in terms of your, your outlook and your, and, your, and your practice and the method in which you practice. Uh, and, and I want to make uh, it, it clear to all of you that I am very much pro the idea of experimentation um, at the right time and in the right places, and I certainly believe that an academic institution of this type is, uh, is, uh, is the right place. The question I have for me is where, where does a transition occur and what, what do we do to consider in a practice like ours more the continuum of architecture uh, and, and less the, the, um, uh, the, mere, uh, the mere experimentation. Um, so I, I think that as, as wiggling goes, I'm going to reserve or perhaps repress my desires to wiggle for those occasions when I'm, I am uh, on a dance floor um, or when I'm uh, uh, joining my son and doing the hokey pokey. Uh, in, in an architectural sense, for me, to wiggle is not enough. Uh, the continuum of architecture, for me, is the essence of how we practice. And uh, to consider the fundamentals of program, structure, form, and light is, is what I, I will hope to achieve in, in, in the work that uh, the work that I do. I'd like to, I'd like to close with um, a, a quote from, from um, Philip Isaacson's book. <clears throat> there is no end to the story of beauty. We have seen that it has many forms and that new ones are added all the time. Like the grand buildings of history or the simple buildings that are close to the hearts of their builders, new forms will share in the magic that comes from harmony. They will be works of art because their ingredients, their materials, colors, and shapes will unite with their settings to lift us above the ordinary. That is what great art does. Thank you.